I usually have NPR in the background. Not the unique anyway. way. That's how I heard it. I just, you know, my stuff this morning. Yeah, it's really nice to see you guys. So, I just at 9.59 saw the I mean, it's in the R and from Michael A. the digital They will start August. The nice thing is, I think. Oh, uh, let me check the date, but I'll I'll talk about that. I wasn't sure I was going to be able to. Okay, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you for being here. I know that we're all missing you. Uh, so I'm going to try to get you to So it just seemed like it was about time to have another communications workshop. So my name is Jamie Holford, and I work for King County Information Technology. I'm a department of one, and I know that I reach out to a lot of you guys for information and for help. And when you signed in, um, there's a sign-in sheet. It has your name. You check the box if you want materials from this presentation, which I'm recording as a Skype recording. We've got best practices, tips, and all that stuff. We'll send it out via email. The second box is a skilling survey. In IT, we're doing a reorg, and we're doing an inventory of what people are good at and what they like to do. And it's the same type of thing when you do WePIN, the Washington Emergency Public Information Network, and you say, yes, I'm really good at media relations. Yes, I'm really good at town halls. I would love it if we could all participate in some kind of survey so that some people would call me and say, Jamie, who can I talk to about AV equipment? I don't know. <laughs> but if we had um, an, a, a survey, we could each go into it and use the drop down menu and it would say, oh, well, Cameron's really good at AV equipment or Facebook Live. Or I need an intern for three hours. Who's got an intern that can go and help me canvas a particular area and hand out documents? I do. Anybody need something? I've got one. She's great. So um, this is our agenda. I want to introduce, start by introducing our new executive team member, Karen Covington. Karen, you want to get up and tell everybody who you are and what you're doing with King County? Okay, so today is my first day. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm new to Seattle. I just moved here from Copenhagen, Denmark, but I'm originally from Houston. Glad to be out of the heat um, and here in Seattle. And I'm really excited to be here. I basically, my career has been in corporate communications and public relations agencies, different uh, industries throughout, never work for government, so this is new for me. Um, but I am passionate about communicating and building relationships, and I'm really excited to really kind of start with, I'm working with Gary Kuhara to work with it Lean and implement that, and really create an internal communications brand and campaign that really touches the entire county, so it enterprise wide. So, um, I'm the person to communicate with, and I really have set some meetings up, with many of you, and I'll be really excited to get forward to working with you and seeing how I can help. Thank you. Welcome. So I'm going to take a moment here. Um, KCIT just won the National Association of Counties Digital Government Award. First place. We've competed every year for seven years. We've been in the top ten, but we won first place this year. This is like the Super Bowl for government <laughs> IT. This is a really good deal. One of the, we won for three reasons. Um, we have a good cybersecurity system. You may not realize that because you're always getting things on your computer. Um, for our focus on the Internet of Things, which DNRP is a huge leader in, and we can thank DNRP for that. And civic engagement. Um, and the reason we won, we, we placed so high in civic engagement, is because of all of you. All the work that Derek Belt did over the last couple of years to really focus on microblogging, the effort that you put into reaching out to your communities, having meaningful engagement with them. So you're the reason that we, um, well, a big part of why we won first place. So it just seemed natural that we would talk about how to do civic engagement better. Before Derek left in November, he talked a lot about peak democracy. This was going to be our new way of doing things, pull that information, engage the community in a different way. We've had 11 topics. We have two people here today to talk about what they did, what worked, and what didn't. Really, we get to see it in action. We also talked about Facebook. Um, for the last several years, 
you know, EGov team has been EGov. That's a division within KCIT. And it's using the government and connecting it in, a, in an online way. We've recently changed our name to Design and Civic Engagement. And Pam Shales is the Director of Design and Civic Engagement, and she's going to tell you why. Yeah, yeah, so when I took this position um, in the interview process, I was a little bit confused about what eGov was. Um, and so we spent some time as a department and kind of unpacked some of the things that we do. And so these are the functional areas. And there's a couple of things to talk about here that are new and some things uh, that remain the same and will continue to be the goodness that has been part of the eGov team now. Uh, DICE, DCE, Design Civic Engagement. Um, so we report, we all report up to Sharon Potts, who uh, is leading what's known now as the delivery team. So I don't know if you've heard that there's been reordering happening in KCIT. It continues. Uh, and Sharon will own the delivery side, which is kind of the front end of any work that happens from an enterprise perspective. Um, as well as individual project-based stuff. Um, so I sit here. There, we have a new uh, offering, user experience, which has been happening out in the world for a long time. And it's been happening informally here for a few years by a handful of people who have the time and scrappiness to get it done. Um, and so we're formalizing that. And I've hired Marissa Melma. She's going to be leading that charge on behalf of KCIT. And what that is is. Uh, building things from the user's perspective. Typically, a business analyst will come in and they'll talk with business owners about what the business needs, about what King County wants to accomplish with something. And the thing that's missing is the audience that will be consuming those things. So Marissa is going to make sure that, um, that users' agendas and needs are reflected in the work, in the language, in the flow. Um, there's a lot of God's work to be done, and she'll be doing it. Visual design. Uh, we've been doing a ton of that already. Um, a lot of it has been under the DNRP banner, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's anything from bringing GIS data to life with maps, to print materials, to signage that you see on buses. I'll show you some examples of that work. And I think one of the opportunities here in, in redefining how we're thinking about ourselves and the way that we're um, delivering is that we need more visual design in the presentation layer of the web, and we need more visual design in the social media outreach work that we're doing. So um, while we're a little thin on resources, I would like to start expanding that group so that, that we're able to bring a, you know, a prettier design layer, a more, um, a more intuitive uh, experience for users so that things are not only consistent but easy to understand. Um, web strategy and platform. That's support of the website, it's content, it's web mastering. We have some dedicated web masters that sit in my team. I know that there's a distributed community for that as well. Um, but trying to, again, bring consistency. All these things kind of work together as a unit. So this, in my brain, is the design side of the house. And then we have civic engagement, which is the area that you all are playing in, although you'll hopefully experience some of the goodness of the other side as well. Um, I worked with Derek Belt for about two hot minutes before he resigned. <laughs> um, he tells me it wasn't about me, and I'm going to hold him to that. <laughs> uh, and it, I, it was a definitely a loss for King County, but we found some good applicants. We've been going through an interview process, and we have a candidate selected that will start uh, mid-August. And I'll have more to say about that as we formalize this. Um, I just saw an email this morning that the process is moving forward. Everything seems to be good. So we have a start date and agreement. But I want to make sure that, um, that the team that's, you know, that my team gets a chance to hear that name and understand who that person is first. Um, but there'll be an announcement about bringing that new person on board. King County is very committed to civic engagement. We need to be involved in two-way communication. We need to be doing that well. We need to be focused on transparency. And I think that this particular role plays a key part in that as a liaison to you guys. So some of the qualities that we looked for in that hire was somebody that was collaborative, open to new ideas, and could bring some more of the technology piece to bear, was active 
in government as well as social media. And I think we found somebody that sort of hits those three areas really strongly. I hope that um, I hope that you enjoy working with them as much as I enjoyed meeting them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the design aspect of the house. I have a couple of user experience uh, projects that um, both. So Marissa has been here for almost three months, and she's already getting traction. Two months, thank you. And I've been here for six. So uh, we both come from non-government backgrounds and consulting. Um, so we're going to struggle with some things, and hopefully we'll be able to bring some of our best practices into this experience so that we can evolve and uh, learn together. Um, so I've got kind of some wireframes-ish. They look designed, but if you look really closely, you'll see that there's uh, a lot of Greek in their placeholder. So these are wireframes for a product called, um, basically it's to pitch uh, Office 365. I thought I had, maybe I didn't. Things may be out of order. I had a before version of this. Um, but I don't see it here. So basically, the problem that we're trying to solve is that people at King County don't know how to use the Office 365 suite. They don't know what the products are good for. They don't know when they should use SharePoint versus Planner versus Word. Um, and a lot of the material that's out there talks about those products from Microsoft's perspective. Here's, here's not, um, like, here's how to use it, but not here's what it's good for, like the layer up, right? So we're trying to help a typical office worker understand the tools that they have available to them so that they can make better choices about what they're using. This is not intended to be deep education, but more of just a positioning of that to help people feel more comfortable about using the products. So Marissa did a usability study, an informal one, with some of the users that we have here at King County to understand what their perspective was, what level of understanding they had coming in, what questions they might have, and what content they would be interested in seeing. Um, as we often learn in usability, the first round of what we put together didn't, didn't meet the mark. It wasn't what they were looking for at all. So a lot of what was discovered in that process was, I don't really care about this. While you may think it's useful and you put something together, it's not going to help me at all. So taking that, con taking that understanding and then building content that helps people make sense of the products was really the goal. Um, so we have here you know, kind of showing you what the products are in the top part, a little video. Um, and then helping you differentiate what's the difference between Office 365 and Office, because people may not know that. How do I get it? How do I use it at home? As some more uh, FAQs, and then exploring the contents of the waffle. Now, again, there's no descriptions here yet, but the idea is that we talk about, here's what this is good for. If you're trying to do this type of thing, use this tool. A second project that was worked on, again, these are built out in HTML. So there's, if you look closely, you'll see there's, um, there's things that aren't populated yet, right? Like there's the, the navigation breadcrumb has level one, level two, level three. But it helps us visualize. It helps the user get familiar with the things that they'll be using. Um, so it's enough of a placeholder to identify the things that we want to get feedback on. So this is for the property tax payments. Um, and there was a lot of property tax lingo in the current experience. It was a couple of links. They used a lot of language that people didn't understand. What's the difference between real property tax and personal property tax? What is real property tax? Well, I, you know, my property taxes are real. I have to write a check. I have to make payment. How do I know which of these is better or the thing that I need to go to? So there's some description here to help understand which of these two entry points is the one that you're really looking for. And nice, what I like to refer to in technical language, big, juicy buttons to start the process with. So you don't have to dig through a bunch of text to find the action, right? So here's your, you enter your parcel number or your tax account, or you enter your personal property tax account, and you go search for the information you need. And then you get into some details here. And one of the other things that's uh, kind of part and parcel in this experience is that we are working with a, um, a common payment platform. So we're trying to move King County towards using the same types of tools across the county. So if you're buying a pet license, if you're trying to pay your property taxes, if you're trying to make a donation, it's all going to go through the same tool. And what that does is a couple of really great things. It's more cost effective for King County because we have one platform to support. So KCIP doesn't have 50,000 people all trying to sort out, you know, what is this thing I'm supporting? We have a bug over here. 
five people go troubleshoot it. Oh, there's another payment engine over here that has a similar problem. We're going to go troubleshoot that one too. Um, so trying to eliminate some of those some of those uh, inefficiencies for our technical team. And the other thing that it does that's really great is it allows for us to focus on the experience in the various places that it's used so that we can build a framework around it so that the data ebbs and flows. It comes and goes and it does what it needs to do and we can put a front end on that that makes sense for the user to accomplish their task. So really trying to demystify and make King County a more enjoyable digital experience across the board. <laughs> so more about that, blah, 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 providing the data that they need to do their work and feel good about the process so you can start to see the charges that you're experiencing and then you go to your checkout. All this is available um, in the deck, so you guys should definitely, if you, if you care about it, you should ask for the deck from Jamie. And even if you don't, it would make us both feel good if you asked for it anyway. <laughs> um, so again, kind of a cart metaphor. This last thing uh, here is... This to me was a real win in a lot of ways, and I'm in a really fortunate position in that a lot of this work happened before I got here, and so I'm just able to talk about it, but um, fine. Um, so I don't know if you've seen the inspection posters out in Seattle. Smiley face, straight line. Um, that all started actually with a graphic designer. Somebody came to them and said, we need a poster, right? And so, um, Wendy put together some iconography that worked, and that all got encompassed into, we need to have this online, and here's what it looks like. We need for the inspectors to be able to print something out so that they can hand something to the restaurant owner that they can put up on the wall immediately. And so this is a more holistic experience of how all these different disciplines can come together to make something that's better for somebody uh, within King County. So you'll see these icons, and this is on the website. So you can actually go on site and search for inspection information. It's map based, you can click on a particular location and get information about them. And here's all the background. So if they have you know, a not so smiley face this time, you can kind of see what they've seen in the past inspections. Maybe they had a bad day, or maybe it's just really a dive and you wanna make sure you've got a lot of tequila in your belly before you eat something there, or not. So then just a couple of other visuals from the design side of the house to show you some of the things that they do, that we do as part of that group. So information that goes out as posters and narrative. You'll see these on the buses. I don't know if you guys have seen this yet, but like nice, big, beautiful visuals that look current, right? This is not, we're not your typical government stoic environment. And then uh, bringing some GIS data to life as well. So you see there's a map here and some call-outs that are talking about the cleanup sites that are available, some information about the event itself. So bringing data and good design together for a better experience for people that is news they can use. Translation. Again, another uh, infographic. One of the things that this team does very well is taking data and making it digestible and easy to understand. Another example of that. Here are the ways that things have changed. Here's what that means to you. More of the same. I had to include the poop poster. <laughs> I get 25 bucks for that, I think, for including the presentation. So how do you get some of this goodness, right? So right now, that the team is um, basically been, uh, the majority of this team is funded through the biennium process, right? So an organization says, I need, I think I need one person for the next two years. I want to, I want to buy that that body, right? So the funding process allows for that to happen. Um, so that's one thing you can do long term is go advocate for getting some of your budget allocated to get some design work in. Um, in the short term, we do have some bandwidth, and we would like to start opening up our services. Um, we would have to do that on an as available basis. But there is a project request form that you can go to online and make a request and we can work with you about what the project is, what your needs are, what budget you have available, our timing, skills, blah, blah, blah. Another reason to get the deck subject to availability or not to be very good. Okay. How okay. much time, time did I over <laughs> Sorry. Um, so what's really important is that um, this is 
the direction that we're going. We're trying to make our websites better, the engagement better, um, using GIS. So really, anything that you can think of, any ideas that you've all that you've always had but you've been limited because we don't have the ability to do that on the web, now is the time to come and talk to us about that because she's assembling this wonderful team that can brainstorm and they they have so much experience doing other things, that they can really bring, bring some great ideas as they brainstorm. Yes? Um, you said something about exploring the waffle? Oh, you know on Google, <laughs> um, you know up in the up in the upper left-hand corner, it's got those nine squares. So so we call it the waffle. Wow, we've got Sorry about that, I'm a nerd. <laughs> can I ask a All question, right. please? So next up, we've got Lindsay. Is this where you started? Uh, yeah, okay. I think they're, yeah, sure. Am I supposed to put this on? <laughs> can everyone hear me? Yeah. Nobody can hear me. Nobody yes, can hear you me. have to speak up. That's only going to go. Yeah. Through. That that is a microphone for this, not a microphone for this. You have to speak from your diaphragm. Okay. I have a little squeaky voice. I will try. Um, so I'm Lindsay. I'm in public health. Um, I'm our digital lead on the team. So I work on a lot of our social media stuff. And um, I've been asked to talk with Cameron today about Facebook Live. Um, how many people in here have used Facebook Live? Does anybody not know what Facebook Live is? OK, so Facebook Live is Facebook's internal live streaming feed. So you can throw a live video up on Facebook, and you can get instant feedback from people who follow the video. So you can answer questions in real time. Um, people can watch what's happening in real time, and then that video is then <coughs> stored on Facebook. So after after you <coughs> recorded your video, people can watch it again. Does that make sense? Okay. So you can use Facebook Live, as you can imagine, with any other live streaming opportunity out there in the world for a number of things. You can show an event. You can um, record a press conference. We at Public Health has really found our groove in doing uh, an interview Q&A format with some of our experts. Um, we've used it for other things, but the case studies that I'm going to talk about today follow this Q&A format. And I think Cameron will show you some different examples. Um, and some of our lessons learned are applicable to the many ways that you would use Facebook Live, and some of them are more for our format. So feel free to ask me questions at any time about it. Um, so. Someone I'm not convinced I can get your video up. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not a big deal. Um, the videos are really just in the slide deck so that if you decided to take these materials later and watch them, you can see kind of how it works. They're fairly long. They're 15 minutes, 20 minutes long. So I wasn't going to show you them anyway um, for any long period of time. So a, a few months ago at Public Health, we noticed that um, there was a problem. There are these mice called deer mice, and they were carrying a rare but deadly virus, <coughs> and people in on the east side were getting sick. And people needed to know how to clean up their homes in a special way to avoid getting sick. Because if you can track this virus, and it's very rare, you're very likely going to die from it. So as you can imagine, we're talking about this issue. It's very scary for people. If you hear that there's a deadly disease that could be lurking in your basement, you're going to have a lot of questions. and there's so a lot of opportunity for misinformation out there. And Meredith, if I'm getting anything wrong about this, feel free to just interrupt me. Just to clarify about the third of people who have to die. A third of people who have to die. So see what happens? I'm like overstating. See how how that could be a problem, right? So um, and so we have these really smart epidemiologists who work in our department and can clarify these sorts of nuanced questions. And so what we did was pair them in a video feed on Facebook and let them answer questions that the public had. We started with a quick overview of what was going on, our latest case reports, and then um, we let the camera roll and people asked questions and um, our staff answered them in real time. And then what happened is following, uh, when our video was finished, 16 minutes later, we boosted that video on Facebook to our audience on the east side, where we were mostly concerned about this illness. And more people asked questions, and we responded to those questions in the comments. Um, and we directed them to certain parts of the video. 
um, where those questions may have already been answered, or we got answers to those questions um, if we didn't already address them in the, in the video. Does that make sense, everyone? Sorry, the video is not working. And this, so this video alone got quite a few views, 6,200 views, um, quite a few shares, quite a few comments. And it's a pretty discreet um, situation where the answers to the questions people had were um, very direct and we were able to answer them in the moment or very quickly afterward. Um, and there weren't too many questions, but some. Do you want to add anything to this, Meredith? What also helped too was that we solicited some questions that we um, working with our partners in the city of Bishop Ball in particular uh, ahead of time so that our experts would have something to talk about right away. So we've already gotten some questions. In. So while people were formulating their questions and typing them in, we already had some questions ready. Yeah, good question. How do you promote the Yeah, good question. And Cameron will talk a little bit about this later, but we. Um, we tended to promote it on Twitter and maybe on Facebook a few minutes before and maybe the day before, depending on. I think we've really noticed that um, people don't have a large attention span, so the longer lead time notifications don't work as well. It's better to just catch people 10 minutes in advance because they're actually more likely to pay attention at that point. And with this particular one, because it was acutely of interest to particular audiences, we worked with um, some of our partners again to visit on particular some organizations out on the east side who then told um, their constituents, public health is going to go live on Facebook at such and such time in the because we couldn't send all of our experts out to all the different places that wanted us to be Any other questions about this? No? Okay. So our more recent Facebook Live was um, with our health officer, Jeff Duchin, and Brad Feingood from uh, PCHS, who talked about safe injection sites and treatment for opiate disorder. And as you can imagine, this subject is highly controversial and, again, prone to misinformation. And there's a lot of communication that we have to do about it to correct that misinformation and to um, show why these safe injection sites, does everybody know what safe injection sites are? Okay, good. Um, might be a useful measure against the epidemic that's plaguing our county. Hope I'm not breaking any laws right now. Um, so, so what we did was we um, Sharon and I actually worked together to uh, draft some talking points for uh, for Jeff and Brad. So they had a script, and then we could anticipate some of the questions that people in the public might have. And um, we gave all this information to Jeff and Brad, and we sat them down together in front of a camera, and um, and then they more or less ignored what we gave them, <laughs> and <laughs> said a lot of really amazing things. They're really good on video and really personable, and they you know work together very well. Um, and we got lots of questions from the public. You can see we have 119 comments here. Um, so uh, Meredith operated the video camera, and I moderated the, the comments and asked questions off camera. Again, I'm sorry that I can't show you that this lovely black box, though. Um, uh, it's technology fail. No, no, no. Ah. It's not. It's, it is, it's my fault. Um, uh, we, we, I asked questions off camera of Jeff, Jeff and Brett as they came in. And then I also knew, because I helped prepare the materials in advance, what questions we wanted them to answer if they didn't get to it or if people didn't answer those questions. So that was our overall strategy in the process. And then after 20 or 30 minutes, we cut the camera and people still had questions and they still had comments. And a lot of those questions and comments were for each other and at each other. And you know, as I mentioned, this is a pretty controversial issue. So we, um, we scanned those comments and uh, called the relevant questions, um, and then we put those questions in a blog post and answered them. Um, we also included the video in that blog post. We also put that blog post on our website, and we boosted that blog post on Facebook, and we shared it on Twitter. So what happened there is that we had a 20 or 30 minute video with a little bit of prep work, and we've been able to share and repackage that content across really all of our digital platforms. Um, which made it incredibly useful. And we were able to answer, I think, 
almost all of the questions that people <laughs> in the public had about that. And I'm sorry, Sherry, I didn't even include you in this, but you were definitely there and definitely involved in all of it from start to finish. Um, any questions about how we did that? Okay. So uh, we have a few lessons learned. Um, sorry, there was yeah. a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, in terms of data, so I know on YouTube you can look and see the average viewing time per video. Mm -hmm. You can get that information for Visa Live. You can't. You can't. It's, you can get that same information for any video that you have on Facebook. So you can see actually over time how many minutes that video has been viewed, not necessarily the total amount of viewing time for each watch. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think you could see that this video has been viewed for 5,000 minutes since we posted it. So you can extrapolate from there. Um, and then one thing I'm just wondering um, if you can share also the strategy around being off camera and having your spokespeople just start jumping in versus asking them lots of questions and um, you know we found it I think in the beginning quite awkward that or seemingly awkward that you have just this voice coming in from off camera without a person there in the screen yeah but just a little bit more information about um, strategy and approach for that yes and that's definitely one of my tips find an extra person to moderate questions and so our first thought about that was that it would feel like this disembodied voice off camera asking questions, what's going on? Um, and, and what we found is that, you know, you have, a, if you are using a tripod, which I think Cameron is going to talk about, you have a pretty narrow frame. And if you have two people on that camera that are talking, that are experts, there's really not a lot of room for anybody else. Those two people need to sit very close together to make it look normal. Um, adding a third person into the mix is complicated and then if you were to try to rotate the camera to look back and forth between people, that would also be a little um, nauseating. So, so we decided to go with the disembodied voice approach, which I think worked really well. Um, as I mentioned, Meredith was in control of the camera, so if something fell, if we, uh, you know, the Wi-Fi broke or um, anything like that, she could be in charge of that. And also, it's really hard to see the questions if you've got your camera on a tripod, I think. Um, so, and then I stood off to the side and I was just reading the questions and comments as they came in. I'd, you know, maybe show Sherry um, if I had, you know, a question or a concern about asking one of those questions. And then I would ask Jeff and Brad and they would respond. Um, and I would just do that whenever I felt like there was an, an appropriate break in the conversation. They're talkative people, so, um, it, you know, we, we never had a silent moment. Um, did, does that answer your question, Sharon? Yeah, so that was our strategy, and I, I suggest if you're taking this format and using it, that that's what you do. And you know, having two people be there in, in that sort of scenario is really, really helpful. Um, and so our strategic conclusions are go in with a plan, but don't rely on it. As I said, we, we planned this whole entire script start to finish, um, and we anticipated questions, but you know, there are lots of things happen that you can't predict. And this is Facebook Live, and it's supposed to feel authentic and in the moment and transparent. And so that's OK. That's what people expect. Um, unlike many other videos, this, the expectation for production value in a Facebook Live is much lower than um, you know, a PSA or something like that. And that's what's so wonderful about it. But it is uncomfortable at first. So um, you know, prep yourself as much as you can. but just know that things aren't going to go your way, and that's OK. Um, one of the ways in that it's on this next slide that things don't always go OK is that your signal can fail. And so what we've learned is that almost always the signal will fail immediately. Um, but sometimes it fails halfway through your Facebook Live. And so you have to make the decision, usually in advance, you can kind of think about it. At what point would we start over from the beginning? And at what point would we say, OK, we lost the signal. We're picking back up from where we left off. And you have two videos on Facebook. Either of those scenarios are, scenarios are OK. You just have to um, think about what works best for you. Um, continue the conversation after the camera stops. And I don't mean that you should just keep talking. I mean that you have, you have a 30-minute video. Can you imagine if somebody came to you and said, I would like you to produce a 30-minute video for me 
um, and it needs to be jam-packed with all of this content, you would say, okay, how about a million dollars, right? <laughs> well, you don't have that, and neither does anybody who's asking you for a video, I don't think. So, but you do have this great Facebook Live footage, so don't just stop at Facebook. Boost it if you can on that platform, share it on Twitter, put it on YouTube, put it on your website, use it as much as you possibly can because video is, you know, pretty rare, I think, for us. Um, and, and like I said, the expectation for production value is not as high as something like this. Yeah? Are you sharing it via Facebook on these other platforms or are you just taking the route video from the camera? Um, I have downloaded it and put it on YouTube um, for our website, which is, I think, the, the preferred medium on our website. And I'm sharing it on our blog via an embedded YouTube. I, I use YouTube. There may be other um, opinions about that here. And I would be willing to hear that. Of the different social channels, which one did you get the most traction from? Was it the blog? Was it your website? Was it Twitter, Facebook? I think that in total, like in terms of viewership for the Jeff and Brad one, and, and really for the Hantavirus one, um, Facebook got us the most viewership, but honestly that's where the, the bulk of our followers are. Um, so, so I think that that's where they saw it. Um, but we still, like this is a fairly niche audience that we're talking about, and so we did a blog post. That blog post got a few hundred views. Um, on our website, there's a link back to our YouTube page, our YouTube page, or our YouTube, the actual YouTube um, feed. It has gotten several hundred views. So, you know, it's spaced out across lots of different platforms, but I think that's okay, especially for something that's not necessarily for everyone to see. This is, would you say this is kind of an alternative to a webinar? Uh, I mean, I think that you could use Facebook in that way with the right audience. If you're, if the audience of your Facebook page is really only internal, or you know, with a a work group or something like that outside of the county, you could do something like that. But um, but other people will see it. So mm -hmm. if you would want a webinar that is visible to everyone. Um, it would be an interesting idea. I think you'd have to think through it a little bit. And I think that there's a limit to the amount of time that you can post videos on certain platforms. So you'd want to be mindful of that, too. I think also, the, uh, from, from a user's perspective, a webinar has an expectation that there is definitely back and forth. And so you'd have to be really intentional to make sure that as comments were coming in, that those were being addressed, right? Because a lot of the software that's available to do those things has that sort of built in. Okay, I'm told that I've gone over. So um, these are just quick technical tips, and uh, Cameron's going to talk more about it. But get your people to look at the camera the whole time. That's something that we didn't do, and it does feel odd. If you, sometimes if you're not talking, your instinct is to look at the floor, look at your notes, and, and that feels weird when you're watching the video. Um, don't fidget if you're on camera. That's also something that we learned. Again, people who aren't used to necessarily being on camera or don't feel like a camera is on them because it's just a phone in their face, um, get very comfortable, actually. And so it's they can start to do funny things. Um, <laughs> uh, you can choose the cover image that goes on Facebook after you post. Um, Cameron may be talking about this, but the Facebook will give you some options. So flip through them and try to find the one where you're, the people on camera aren't like that. <laughs> Um, and you can also edit and adjust the text, the intro for your post after you post it. Um, sometimes. If Wi-Fi has failed or whatever, you haven't had a chance to really um, articulate your message as well as you thought you could, or there's a typo, you can actually fix it after the fact to take advantage of that. And then, as I mentioned, plan for the worst case scenario, which is that Wi-Fi goes out. Okay. Thank you. So um, these are a couple of ways that we have used uh, Facebook Live just for um, news conferences lately. Uh, one of them was for the introduction of uh, the Best Starts for Kids, the new um, uh, school clinics that are going to be opening, a bunch of other stuff. Um, and then the other one was celebrating regional animal services. We got a $75,000 grant doing lots of great stuff with it. 
cool thing about this is we, we use these on uh, just a regular King County page, which is now called King County Washington Governor. Uh, Facebook's got new rules about that. Um, most of our posts on there are only getting 500, 600 people viewing them, if that. Uh, these two, 8,376 and 6,289. It's for boring news conferences. <laughs> Why? Because Facebook puts these up in the top of people's timelines. That's what they're pushing right now. So that's why they want you to do this Facebook Live thing. So yeah, 15 to 20 times our normal reach uh, on our uh, generic King County page. <clears throat> Part of the way that we did that was about an hour before uh, or maybe two hours before each one of these, we did promos on both Twitter and Facebook, same graphic with information about what was going, who was going to be talking, what it was going to be talking about, time, and then of course giving the <clears throat> the link to it. So Lindsay kind of told you about the content. I'm going to talk to you about the tech stuff. Um, again, promote it at least 60 minutes, if not more. Uh, before the event starts on the day of. Check your Wi-Fi and cell signal strength. The plan I'm using cellular, uh, to be honest with you, if you've got a phone, um, I've noticed that it keeps a stronger signal and less chance of dropout. Uh, however, I can guarantee you it's going to drop out. You're going to start it, you're going to go for five seconds, and it's going to drop out. It's happened every time. We've done this 12 times now, and 12 out of 12, it will drop out in five seconds. But then does um, it come back? No, it does not. So that's the other tip I'm going to give you. <laughs> um, set your smartphone to do not disturb. That seems to also help the signal a little bit because you don't have stuff coming into your phone while you're trying to broadcast. Um, so that will keep your email, you know, all of those alerts, those kind of things. The one thing, if you come out of this with nothing, is remember your audio. People will forgive bad video. They will not forgive bad audio. We used to have a saying in TV was, TV without, or, or sorry, um, TV without video is radio. TV without audio is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so check your audio. Have a good mic. Make sure it's close to people that are speaking. Make sure the audio is good. People will forgive bad video before they'll forgive good audio. Even though we're live and it's a visual thing, if you can't hear it, it's worthless. Um, I talk about uh, pre-roll. Get this deck, by the way, because I have more of this in there. Except if you're doing pre-roll, I talk about how the signal drops out. So go ahead and start about a minute or two beforehand. Flip your camera to the back camera, and you yourself give kind of a promo or a tease of what's going to be coming up. So I just say, hey, Cameron Satterfield, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're going to have King County Executive Guy Constantine talking about whatever he's talking about today. We're here live at Seattle Children's Play Garden. Um, you know, got lots of people here. Hope to, that you'll tune in, whatever. Not only does that give you a chance to restart your stream when it busts five seconds in, but the other thing, too, <clears throat> is that it gives people a chance to tune in because no, people aren't going to tune in right on the dot. So um, if you get in there, do some pre-roll, kind of set people up for what's going on, then what will happen is it'll flip to the top of their timeline, they'll tune in, and they'll stay tuned in. Things and flip your camera back over to that camera and actually do the event when you know, or your department director or whoever walks up. Tripod is a must. Again, people will forgive bad video. But if it's shaking around like we're having Cascadia 9.0, they're going to tune out. So you must have a tripod. And for the love of all that's good, this way. No vertical video. It looks terrible. You get turned like this on Facebook, and that's the way it will stay posted. So remember. And if you've got a tripod and a decent uh, mount, and I've got some uh, gear over there you can take a look at, It'll automatically hold your phone in landscape or horizontal mode anyway. Um, and then check the ambient light. This light is actually not very good because we don't have all of the lights on and they're not full strength. Um, but most places with your phone, it'll be okay. But um, if you don't, uh, if the lighting situation is poor or whatever, um, consider a little thicker light. And again, I've got a little kit over there you can take a look at um, later. 
Post event. Um, the Facebook algorithm keeps the formerly live videos at or near the top of the news feed. So take advantage of that. Boost your post. Do all the things that you need to do. Do some editing maybe afterwards of the actual post text itself uh, to kind of drive things. Cross promote it um, using other Facebook pages, uh, either other King County agencies, if they can share your video, or if you're doing a news conference or an event with a, a, a partner in the community, have them share it. Um, download your video afterwards. Not only is it good for records retention, um, but then you can uh, take and edit that and pick out short clips, 20 to 30 seconds, that you can then share, uh, especially on Twitter. Uh, if you've done a Facebook Live, take a 30 second clip, share it on Twitter, and then send them to the whole uh, Facebook Live post, either the post itself or if you download it and share it on um, YouTube. So that's what I've got for you. Um, one of the things that Jamie's going to send out is I got a little tech tips sheet that goes into way more detail than I do. Um, and, and I've also got kind of an equipment list if you want that as well. But you can go ahead and take a look at what I put together for our live streaming kit um, over there. And yeah, so I'm trying to be quick. <laughs> so uh, any questions? Right, cool. So just for everybody's uh, knowledge, this little setup that I have right here is great. It's a wireless mic. It's here. You are welcome to borrow it anytime you like if you want to do something like that. We checked all the audio out uh, in advance, and I think I'll hear from people um, whether or not it's working. Okay, so in November, um, Derek talked to us about Peak Democracy and how it's an online open house on steroids. We've had 11 topics. It's been enormously successful. I think we're one of Peak Democracy's top candidates, and I'm pretty sure that Metro broke the system, but that's good because then they got a whole lot better. Um, we've done everything from master plans on Vashon Island to veteran services. Peak Democracy is in multiple languages. What's really cool about it is that anything that you would do in a regular open house, you can do online. So if you, you know, those old open houses where you roll the whole corridor out and then you put stickies, oh, the pink things are things that I really care about. And, you know, you don't have to do any of those, well, you can do these things in, in person, but doing them online is really effective because a lot of people can't show up to your open house, as you know. So only get about 10% of the people that you really want to hear from actually contributing to what you're saying. Um, this thing, the, the mantra of KCIT, IT mobility and civic engagement is we want people to be able to conduct business and transact their business with the government wherever and whenever is most convenient. So peak democracy really embodies that. So we've got a couple of samples, a couple of uh, topics that were enormously successful. So I'm going to write those guys up here. This is Frana. <coughs> she looks for our parts. Oh, that is, that, 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 I just put that in there so we'd see. I was hoping that I'd be able to get um, the, so when you go to, when you go to Peak Democracy, if you Google King County Peak Democracy, it'll take you to the We Want Your Feedback page. And this is what it looks like. This is what the topic looks like. So it introduces it here. And then if we were to open this up, feedback, you just see tons and tons of information, really specific information, drilling down data, sliced and diced in about a zillion different ways based on like which bus they take, um, demographics, maps that show you, oh, the people here are responding a lot, but the people here are not, which is really helpful because then you can say, boy, we really need to do a whole lot more outreach over here with these groups because we've only got three responses from the people that live in Issaquah. We've got a thousand responses from the people in Bellevue. What's not working here? So I think you can speak to that. So again, my name is Fran. I'm with King County Parks on the uh, Business Development and Partnerships team. And uh, our project that we used for development of uh, Democracy for was for the development of the Green to Cedar Rivers Trail. Um, it is an existing trail in, around the Maple Valley area, and we are going to be paving it and standardizing it to the regional trail standard, kind of like uh, if you're familiar with the Sammamish River Trail or the Bird Gilman Trail. So. We uh, have been in the process of development 
Uh, we've had a few in-person meetings and got to a certain point in the design process where we wanted to take out um, some of the technical details to community members and get their input on it. Uh, our goals for doing the, in uh, the online opening house was that we were also doing one in person and we knew just exactly what Jamie said. We knew that that is, has a limited capacity to engage people. Not everybody can make it um, to Lake Wilderness Lodge in Maple Valley, which is where this, the meeting was, um, to participate. So we wanted to uh, try to expand the, the people who were able to provide their feedback for this. So our goals were, um, again, expanding the opportunity to participate, but then also specifically, you know, we know the people who were coming to the meetings who have been vocal in this, we know who they are, they're gonna continue to show up at the meetings, um, but that's not everybody, and they're not reflective of the entire community or the, um, the way that everyone feels uh, about the trail. So we were really looking to broaden the, the geographic scope as well to hear from people. A lot of the people who were showing up to the in-person meetings were immediate neighbors. And so we were hoping, since this is a regional trail that is going to serve all two million of us here in King County, we wanted to try to, to broaden the geographic scope of participation. So we took the information from the, the uh, in-person um, and put it online. And one of the things that we liked about um, Peak Democracy, unlike some of the tools that King County has used in the past, is that we were able to model exactly what we were doing um, in person. You know, we, at the meeting, it was actually exactly what you said with the roll plots and lots of things on easels and post-it notes everywhere and markers and a whole bunch of us staff standing around um, asking, you know, responding to questions. And so we kind of wanted to take that and put that same experience online. And with Peak Democracy, all of that was possible, which was wonderful um, because they're, you know, big, these are big design documents, so they're graphically very, you know, large files, but Peak Democracy was able to take them, chop them up, and make them thumbnails, make them work so that they loaded faster um, when you would go into the survey. So this is one, this is a screenshot from part of the survey. Um, just to give you an overview of what it was, we had it open for eight days. Uh, some of that was just driven because of where we are in the timeline. So probably not the best practice, but that's the reality that we were dealing with. We asked questions about trail use, trail design, and demographics. Uh, we included maps and graphics, and then we used a variety of question types. So some of them were multiple choice, some of them were ranking questions, and then we had several open-ended questions. So our um, snapshot of the results, okay, right before I go to that, um, we had 627 visitors overall. Of that, 229 people left responses. Uh, 85 were registered and 144 were unregistered. And what that means in Peak Democracy, which has been uh, an obstacle on other online engagement platforms, is that you don't have to create a profile. You don't have to create a, an account. You can just be anonymous in your responses. That's not necessarily becomes public information as part of the conversation, but for staff, we still get uh, the ability to see your input. So the registered responses, people, that meant they logged in. If you, just as anyone right now, if you go in to this, you can see those 85 responses, but as staff, we have the ability to see everybody's responses, so. Did you worry about getting trolled? Of course, yeah, absolutely. And we continue to monitor it. Um, there were some interesting answers. <coughs> Uh, the style of this was much more of a survey style, so it wasn't really encouraging people to interact with each other. Um, but for the most part, yeah, we just monitor as it went. We didn't have any problems with the, the responses or felt at any time that we needed to take something down. Um, so as far as the, the way Peak Democracy, they also give you a snapshot of what that means in terms of public comment. So according to how they figured out, they said that it was 11 and a half hours of public comment if each person had been speaking 50 minutes each. And I think that's an interesting way to, to capture the impact of having this tool. Also, Peak Democracy does do some screening for inappropriate content. So if, if somebody had tripped a wire, used profanity, 
you know, really participated in an argument, you'd be hearing about that from their moderation side as well. So that's part of the part of the product that we get. <coughs> So one of the keys to having uh, a successful peak democracy experience is the promotional effort. So this captures a little bit about what we did to get the word out there. Again, we only had eight days. Um, we started this the day after the meeting. So people at the meeting were made aware of the online open house going live, and then we promoted it in a variety of ways. So we did uh, buy Facebook ads. Uh, the reach was to more than 22,000. Um, link clicks were 351, so I thought that was a really um, a good entry point for people to get to the survey. We use our own social media platforms, and then uh, we also use Gov Delivery for our email newsletters. We have one specific for this project that has, um, well, between that one and our um, just general King County Parks e-news, it was more than 7,000 subscribers. So. Um, that, for us, that's a really effective tool to reach our audiences. <coughs> and then we really counted on our kind of close friends and family, so to speak. So we have a lot of partners, uh, nonprofit organizations, community groups that we've been working with. We have a stakeholder advisory group for this capital project, and we asked them to distribute it to kind of the constituencies that they're representing. Um, and that really helped us um, carry the message out to, to a variety of groups. We also use it daily um, to promote it, so we shortened the address, otherwise it would have been about this long. So we created a bit.ly, and then we also get the, um, the analytics from that. Oh. CEOs, community-based organizations? Yes. <laughs> you get the acronym of the day. No, that's awesome. <laughs> Did you have uh, any CEOs that rely on languages other than English? You know, in this community, we, we haven't found that that's the case. So we didn't choose to, to do any translations of this. But, but Peak Democracy will help you do that. That's one of the benefits of this product, is that it does do translations. And we'll talk a little bit more about translations where King County is going with him. Okay. Uh, I, I, I missed something in the presentation. There was a, we had an event at the Big Valley. And then um, people, but that was not, it was a, live event but not recorded in any way, is that right? Right. Okay, so then after the fact, then that's when we got some comment period. Is that right? Um, I don't think comment period actually captures it. We were just giving a different option for participation. So we knew that having one in-person meeting, um, which was well attended, there were more than 50 people who came to that um, meeting, that that wasn't capturing everybody that we were trying to hear from. So we took essentially what we did in person um, as far as the questions go, the information that we were seeking, put that online um, through Peak Democracy and use that to gather additional feedback to complement the, the in-person meeting that we posted. Okay. So it wasn't um, a two-way situation outside of the meeting? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, uh, the, the way that we set up the, the questions, it was really much more survey style where we're asking you which question, which um, option do you prefer? What is your your most favorite characteristic of option number one? What is your least favorite characteristic? Uh, if what would make the trail more usable for you? Uh, if you rank these three different things that we have to balance in our design, which one is the most important to you? So we were asking those type of questions. So it really was a, more of a one way give us your feedback kind of a conversation. Um, However, we plan to use it in different ways in the future, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, so this is the screenshot of our Facebook event, I mean our Facebook um, ad. And then to come back to um, circling back on this with our kind of final um, reflections is, you know, this conversion rate between the 614 visitors to the to Peak Democracy survey and the 229 responses, that um, comes out to be about 37% actually dug in and went through the whole survey. Um, in my book, that's a really amazing conversion rate. Usually it's right around 10 to 15% on these things, so I feel like that for us shows that we were reaching the right people um, in the right ways, and they jumped on board and they participated. Um, and I, 
feel like it was reading through all of the answers that people gave, it feels like it was a different group of people. It didn't feel like it was the same people who were attending the meeting. So it seems like it was a broader representation. Was your, the quality of responses different? I mean, did you feel like they had more time to think about the answers? Um, <coughs> or not? That's a good question. I, I don't know that I can tell that. Yeah, and that's actually one of the things that, um, one of the, the drawbacks, I think, of people democracy is that you can't tell how long somebody took doing the survey, filling out the questions, or being on the, you know, being in that space of democracy. So we don't know if people just went through bam, 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 and knocked out the answers in two minutes, or if it took them 10, if they took their time to pull up all the pictures. I, I wasn't able to tell that. But one thing that I was absolutely thrilled about was the support that we got from the Peak Democracy staff. So we were struggling with the questions and kind of how we were going to present this because it's a complicated project. We had to present um, several different sort of cross-section uh, conceptuals of what the design could be. And they really um, helped us work through all of that and um, fine-tuned our questions and kind of the way we were asking them. So the support from, from Peak Democracy was amazing. Um, and then the other thing is just the, the note about dissemination. So if you want people to participate in this, you need to get it out there on every possible channel, you know, really know who, who it is you're trying to reach, what are the most effective ways to get to them and engage them. You know, in some cases people put in, um, you can use incentives and things like that for um, filling out surveys. We didn't do that this time, but I felt like we still got a really great response to it. Um, and then in the future, the ways that we plan to use it, um, you know, we'll continue to use it for seeking feedback on our CIP project. So when we're developing a new trail or building something in one of our parks, uh, we have lots of those kind of projects. I'm sure we'll continue to use this in different ways on that. Um, I think another thing for us will be assessing customer satisfaction. Uh, with our park system, you know, different parks that you go to or just overall satisfaction with how we're doing. Um, and, and then the other thing is when we have uh, different policy or rule changes, uh, we actually have one coming up uh, next month. Uh, we um, allow hunting. It's just kind of a legacy thing in one of our parks on uh, Bastion Island. And we have been doing that out of kind of respect to history. Um, for the past five years, and we're considering renewing that. And so we want to put the questions out there to the community about how they feel and has it been successful so far with the model that we've been doing, um, and what do we need to tweak? And so we're going to use Peak Democracy with that audience to have that conversation. Um, yeah, so that's, that's all. Any questions? Yeah. And you said that the uh, eight days of the survey and stuff maybe wasn't best practices. Do you have a better idea of what? best practice might be? Is it two weeks? Is it three weeks? Yeah, I feel like um, probably two weeks seems about right. And it depends also your promotional points. You know, we definitely, as soon as we went live and started promoting, that's probably when we got the bulk of the participation. <coughs> and then we did another push. You know, we just kind of kept it in our social media and kept pushing it out there. And then partners, as they had time, would push it out as well. So we would see spikes in each time. So in some ways, you know, working with partners, if we're going to expect them or request of them to carry our message for us, they need their time as well to be able to reach out in on their timeline for how they reach their communities and their constituencies. So kind of need to figure in all those factors with the amount of time when you're going live. But, but really, the best time is when the people first see a survey. So they're going to either click on it at that moment and finish it it's not really the kind of thing you come back to normally. And I think you also get to keep, you have all of these people now registered, so you can reach yeah. back out to them. Yeah, and that's one thing on Peak Democracy. Let's go back and show you the front page. They have this area called Outcome. And so then we will go back. We're going to have another um, meeting that's actually on the trail when we're going to present how the uh, design since this point this milestone, how the design has evolved and what it will look like on the ground. So we're going to have an uh, on the trail um, presentation. And uh, we'll, we'll put up that information in the outcome area so that then all those people who, the 85 people who registered now, 
they will um, see that we've just posted something and they'll see how we were able to use their information. And it's sort of an easy way for us to be able to report back to the community. The other thing is that now that they're registered, anytime that any King County um, agency does a peak democracy, that's one thing that peak democracy offers is do you want to send out a note to the whole kind of registered users of peak democracy for King County and let them know that there's a new survey. And so that's a whole nother audience because if people registered for transit, they also received a note that, hey, there's one about parks. You might want to go there and check that out. So um, that also helped us reach an audience that we don't normally, we may, it might not be the same people that, that are interested in parks. Thank you. Martin and I work at um, King County Metro. I'm the public and employee engagement manager there. Um, I just came to that position from being in the DOT director's office communications group and, and noticing Tristan Cook in the back uh, there is a community relations planner um, where we lead public engagement efforts on behalf of Metro. So um, feel free to come up, Tristan, and add anything at the end as we talk about our lessons learned using the Peak Democracy tool. Um, okay. So the case study I'm going to talk to you about is um, how we use uh, peak democracy as part of a public engagement effort we've just completed to look at a uh, fair change that Metro is going through right now. So um, the process we began back in March, it kind of went through June. There were three chunks of engagement um, pieces that we did, but our goals were really to inform a short-term fair simplification process. So that's um, the example I'm going to walk through today is how we got feedback on two fair change options. Um, but also to inform a long-term work program to help speed up boarding, um, improve access, affordable access to transit, to improve safety on the transit service, um, and then to bring us more in line with our regional partners, our regional transportation providers. So we had this kind of two-year long-term effort. We wanted to get feedback on that. We had the short-term fare simplification goal. So our engagement process that lasted from March through June was designed to get feedback in multiple ways on those two things. Um, we had a stakeholder engagement piece, so we formed an advisory group that met over the course of March through June. Um, we uh, interviewed stakeholders, um, we did briefings to multiple stakeholder groups, so that was one sort of track of engagement that we did. Um, we did contracted community-based organization outreach, so we partnered with three organizations around the county to hear from people that wouldn't normally participate in our meetings or come to our online forums and surveys to give their feedback. Um, so specifically targeting people who don't speak English language, English as a, their primary language, um, low income, seniors, people with disabilities. So that was a, a, another track of outreach that we did from March to June. And then we really used the online survey tool in two phases of general public outreach that we did, one at the beginning of the project and then a second one after we came up with these fair change options. So that's kind of an arc of how we did that. So the two on the two times we used Peak Democracy were for this online, um, these this online engagement part. Uh, the first at the launch of the project, we were asking people how we're doing at meeting our goals around our fair policies and how we could improve and what we should be focusing on over the next two years. We used that feedback along with feedback from our advisory group to come up with the two options that we then brought back out in the second phase of public engagement. We got feedback using Peak Democracy, an online survey tool and in two face-to-face -face meetings that we did and street team at first that we did at Transit Center. So this was a piece of a, a larger public engagement effort. Uh, let's see, what was I gonna say about that? I, I followed friends lead in the format, that was good. Um, so why do we use Peak Democracy? We typically do some kind of online survey or comment as part of our outreach for Metro. Um, so, Beat democracy, why would we use that? We see, saw the advantages of the relationship building aspect of, the, of the, the tool. We saw the advantages of being transparent because as soon as people start answering these questions, you can see the feedback right away. So if I go back and you see this uh, tab, if people click on that, you can see the results of what you've heard. So um, it, it's not up to us to then decipher, interpret feedback and then share it back out with people. They can see it right away, there's transparency there. There's some, some 
kind of downsides to that, which I'll share later. <laughs> but um, so it, it kind of makes it more like what you're planning, what you're hearing isn't a secret to anyone. It's not going into a black box where we're picking and choosing what we're hearing and then giving you back what, what we wanted you to say. Um, everybody can see it. So we thought those, those the relationship building and the transparency aspect would make our, our work easier and be better for the public in terms of their engagement experience. Um, what were we trying to learn? We were trying to learn uh, in the second phase of outreach um, people's preference on which adult fair change they preferred, uh, but also which one would best meet the goals that we were trying to achieve that the public helped inform. So you said, this is important to you, this is important to us. How would each of these options do at meeting those goals? So that was the kind of feedback we were trying to get in the survey that we designed. And then we wanted to get some feedback on how we would mitigate any affordability issues that would come up as a result of implementing either of these options. So um, this was kind of the, the set of things we were asking about. Please indicate whether you agree or disagree with these following statements. Is it easy to understand? Would it make it easier and faster for people to get on the bus? So it's kind of a structure of the questions that we asked. And then we used like, um, in terms of, we had some mitigation options, and so we could have 10 dots that you allocated to whatever um, mitigation options you wanted to. You could put all 10 dots on one of them, you could put two on one and two on the other, <laughs> um, but we used that feature of the online survey tool in this survey. Um, how we promoted it, we had a project website that was visited 8,400 times. We uh, did media and social media promotion and news release. We have a blog, Facebook and Twitter. So um, we reached 2,800 through our Facebook account and 100,000 through Twitter. Uh, we had 21,000 impressions and 207 click-throughs from our social media promotion. We have Gov Delivery Transit Alerts. So if you um, are signed up to receive transit alerts for any routes you ride, some of you are nodding because you probably receive these, uh, we send notices out to that. So a Metro has 57,000 subscribers to all of our transit routes uh, throughout the county. And that's when we broke the system. Because <laughs> when you send a transit alert out to 57,000 people and 29% open it and 9% click through, the peak democracy system could not handle that level of response at the same time. So immediately had to send out another translator saying, hey, we still want to hear from you. <laughs> Come back later, please. So, um, so I think they're, they're bulking up on their uh, back end uh, system to be able to support that level of <laughs> notification and instant follow-up. If you can handle Metro, you can handle that's right. <laughs> so that's what we So we broke the system twice with that um, outreach. Uh, and they are helping. But in the, in the meantime, before they bulk up their kind of capacity to respond to that many um, people on their system at once, uh, we're having to learn how to use Gov Delivery to send out notifications over, you know, it's kind of more time consuming to send it out in chunks uh, over the course of a period of time. So uh, that is a functionality with Gov Deliver Delivery if any of you have that problem. We had coach posters on all of our buses. Uh, we did street teams, as I talked about, um, in three places around the county. We had flyers distributed at customer service locations and in our transit tunnel by um, the ambassadors that people board the buses down there. And then we did um, e-notifications to stakeholder and interest groups and elected officials who helped spread the word. Um, we did one at the Renton Transit Center, one at the Bellevue Transit Center, and one at North Bay Transit Center. <coughs> Are all in English? Or were the people with different languages? They were in English. They were in English. Um, so we, we had some decisions to make around make language access for this project. Yeah. And we, um, ended up doing our online engagement in English. Our um, handouts were translated, and our, our website was translated into Spanish and English. So we did Spanish and English in terms of our uh, print materials and our website. Um, and then we spent like $20,000 on contracted community-based organization outreach. So instead of going whole hog at translating everything fully, making sure that every face-to-face -face event had multilingual speakers, um, we invested our resources that way to reach those populations. Um, but it, there's trade-offs, I think, that come with all of that. Um, specifically with Peak Democracy, the tool that's available there is Google Translate. So anyone can go onto your forum and translate your survey or your thing into their language. So we had some people take the, the do the online engagement survey um, in Spanish. We see that in the results that we now have to go through. Um, I don't think any other languages were represented in that way. Um, we definitely got some feedback that the translation wasn't very good in certain places. So, um, yeah. So, should we have to put up the survey in other languages? That you know, at the cost of however much that would have been, and that with the time we had, we chose to invest those resources with those community-based organizations to do face-to-face -face surveying and outreach with the people they serve, as opposed to doing it online. 
And so, and Veterans Affairs did um, did it in multiple languages. Yeah. They did like ten languages. So if you go to the Peak Democracy thing, you can look at the different topics. It's in Vietnamese. It's written in Somali. It's mm -hmm. written in everything. And um, we've done that with Survey Monkey as well. And Tristan, you've had good ex I mean, just experience doing that more times than I have. I think we've had mixed mixed results with um, translating surveys online and participation in that for the amount of resource that's spent to do that. And it, I think some of it depends on how much you're able to promote it. And how you get people there. I don't know, Tristan, if you want to say more about Yeah, so I mean, we've done surveys in Spanish. We did So it's kind of, and I think it's a learning a field of great learning for all of us, right? To figure out what works and what doesn't. It's probably different things for different projects and different groups. You have to reach. So being uh, flexible. So we had um, two of the peak democracy platforms in our second uh, survey that we did on the two adult fair change actions. We had 9,699 visitors. We had 6,656 responses. Uh, 936 were registered, but a vast majority were not <laughs> registered, 5,720. We had 337.8 hours of public comment at three minutes of response. So um, those were the, the kind of results we were able to get in terms of participation. Um, and I'll focus now on kind of our learnings with this tool. So um, what are our reflections? It's, it, this is a great added resource. Peak Democracy is super helpful, responsive. A great, um, a, it's like another staff person on your team to help you plan this and do public, online public engagement in a very high quality way. So that's great. But it did mean adapt. It does mean and has been adapting our internal work process to work with that format. So I think Peak Democracy is really designed as a one-stop shop. You have your portal, your King County Connects portal, all the forums that are in there. Metro has a its own web online portal for engagement. And so how do we kind of how the twain shall meet. Where do you send people? Do you send them to the King County portal? Do you send them to your own? If you send them to your own, they have to click three or four times to get to your survey, so you've got barriers already in place before they're giving you their feedback. So just kind of thinking about those things, how we how we fit their form into our form um, and our processes. And then you're not in control. So we're pretty savvy at make, whipping up Survey Monkey surveys. In this case, um, we had to build, get privileges added to be able to do administration and <laughs> democracy. Um, but you're really relying on a third party to get your thing set up and to make sure it's working the way you need it to be working. So for us, it was like, oh, we have to build in, you know, they need three days to build it. We used to build it in a day. So just kind of your own, building that into your timeline and working with an external vendor to build something and get it implemented was a change for us. Um, I think we're, we have, we have mixed reviews about peak democracy as a survey tool. Um, on the one hand, uh, they have multiple forum types, so it's not all just a survey tool. There's a there's like a plan tool or a map tool that you can have an image and people can put dots in it. Um, because of the am amount of people whose feedback was not captured and shown, and that because they were unregistered in their participation rates, the extent to which it met our transparency needs <laughs> was was limited. Right, because the majority of people who responded, their feedback does not show up in that in that um, that feedback tab, um, because the, the it's missing some functionality that SurveyMonkey has. So the other thing we do is we take the Excel thing you get from SurveyMonkey and we create reports and we have to do fancy reporting on everything. Pictum actually gives you a PDF of the survey results or a CSV file. <laughs> so I just felt like the last three weeks learning how to use Excel to turn a CSV data into documents, but where before I had survey monkey you know, producing you know easy charts that I could just quickly so just the the kind of features and functionality of peak democracy as a survey tool, it needs some more functions I think to be super useful if you're doing robust or complex survey work with that as a tool compared to other survey tools such as survey. Um, I talked about the scalability and size limitations when we sent out that feature notification and we broke down the system. So <laughs> just 
we're going to help them grow. <laughs> They're helping us grow. We'll do the same for them. Um, and then the other piece about um, the other forum types, I think we had a desire, certainly doing bus changes, it's super helpful to get map-based information from people. Where are you Where are you getting on the bus? Where are you trying to get to? Um, if we could look at that and map and everybody can see it, that'd be awesome in our planning efforts. Um, you can't use that map tool in the survey tool, right? You, you can use one forum type for your engagement. So just knowing what forum type is the right fit for you, Peak Democracy can help you figure that out. But we were hoping to be able to <laughs> like mix and match and use all the tools in different ways, um, and we weren't able to do that. So um, maybe that's coming in the future, and that would be great. Uh, we got a lot of feedback, not a lot. I feel like it was the most negative feedback we got was around privacy. I'm going to stop this and help us manage the social media on this project. Um, I, I think kind of the, the Twitter railing about the privacy concerns. Um, when you go to participate in this in a Peak Democracy forum and you select, I want to participate as a registered or unregistered user. They have a nice description of that, but it's stock language that we can't change. And it says, if you're going to participate as an unregistered user. It essentially, has this really strong did, language. It's like your feedback will not be considered as seriously. As if you didn't we agree to change system. that, though? I haven't seen any All agreement right. to change I, that. I, I remember we had that conversation. I'll follow up with them. Push back on it. Because, yeah. yeah, because that wasn't very good language. Right. So so if you say, I'm going to participate as an unregistered guest to get this language, it's like, you don't matter. I consider you as seriously as, <laughs> as those who participate as registered users. And so it was kind of a real turnoff to a lot of our survey savvy transit writers who are used to just popping in and giving us their quick feedback and now we've created this theory where we ask all this personal information for them to give feedback and have it be considered seriously. Um, and just that, that trade-off between um, how do you encourage a large number of people to respond and reduce the barriers for them to participate when you ask someone to create a relationship with you which has value for us in the long term, not everybody wants to. <laughs> everybody wants to have a relationship with you on an ongoing basis. Um, and, and so then you're creating a barrier for people to give you their quick feedback on which fare change they like. Because they have to think, oh, how, do I really want to give them information about myself before I do this? So it's, it's just, you know, there's, it's a double-edged sword and there's value in both. And so it's just a thing we have to think about as we use tools like this moving forward. Um, privacy, stock language, so we talked about the multiple languages, um, the results reporting. <clears throat> yeah, I guess in terms of, I talked about the feedback and how it just shows the results of registered users and not unregistered users, so we have work to do in that outcome tab to tell the story of what we heard from everybody. Um, to the point of achieving transparency, it sure did. We had um, the Seattle Transit blog looked at that feedback tab and did their own analysis of the feedback we received, published a story on it, what they thought that meant for us in terms of the policy change we should make. Um, but it was reflective of 900 and some people we heard from, not the 6,000 we heard from. So, um, you know, like you're just missing. That's a big group of people that you're missing the feedback from if you're making analysis based on that transparency feedback. Um, and then I talked about the download options being challenging. And then I, the other piece of that is if partnering with a, another agency. So um, Tristan's been doing work on our 520 bus service changes in partnership with Sound Transit. So um, Sharing the data with Sound Transit, because we're asking questions on their behalf about their service, is a challenge. They don't have a license to get into that system. In SurveyMonkey, you can share a link and they can get the data they need. In this case, you have to download really huge files and prepare it in a certain way and share it with them. So it makes kind of partnering to do engagement a little bit more of a challenge. So um, anything I missed, Tristan, about lessons learned? Staying connected and building relationships. I think it's... it's um, it is allowing us to do that. That's great. I think that you can't necessarily get back to the same people that took, like, so we, how do I say this? Our, most of our outreach efforts are multi-phase. So we did two online surveys in this engagement effort. We wanted to get back to the people who did our first survey when they did the second survey to say, here's what you told us. Here's how that feedback was used. Take this next survey. So we want to build a relationship with people over time through the course of one project. Um, Peak Democracy is set up really well for a one, a, an episodic moment of public engagement, but not necessarily for that multi-phase on a particular topic. So we had to ask for people's email addresses who did the first survey if they wanted to be notified about the second survey. We couldn't target only people that had done that first transit survey within the Peak Democracy system and maybe the second survey, if that makes sense. 
we can send a note out to everybody who's registered in King County's Chief Democracy System. So to that point, that's a lot of great people who we might not always hear from. Really cool. Um, but it's harder to do that. You can't generally uh, create a niche relationship with a group of people over a particular topic. And maybe they'll grow in how they... Yeah, and I think it's so. Have. So we are their biggest customer, their best client. Um, they have they have bent over backwards to help us, and and when we've given them feedback like this is what we need, you know, I remember talking to them, you know, we're going to send this out, and I said, you know, we have 2.2 million people in our county. Uh huh. No, really, <laughs> Metro's really big. Yeah. No, really. Um, and so now I think that they're realizing that we are really big, and we have because we are where we are. We, our customers and our clients are super engaged. They just are. So that's that's been a learning curve for them. But they seem to be really embracing it. Yeah. So I want to. I know it's almost time to go. I know that you guys want to know a little bit about language um, and translation as part of our events today. So Pam's going to talk in one minute, right? Yep. See that big word draft? <laughs> <laughs> that's the no. So as we talk about. Um, equity and, and social justice, ESJ, EJS, something like that. Um, there's a kind of four things that we're thinking about from a KCIP perspective, and it's really about delivery on. Thank you. It's really about delivery on those things. The first side, and, and looking at this from a metaphor of crawling, walking, and running, we have to start building, and we have to build towards the future that we think we understand. So everything in these columns is something that we just kind of put up on the wall and we're going to vet that and crisp it up and get teams assigned to really look at it. So it's um, this is all just a framework. So translation, what we're doing on the website, what we're doing with all channel communication, like with peak democracy and getting um, materials out to people in, the, in their first language or language of, of preference. What we're doing with web accessibility is another piece of it, so that we're not hiding content through technology, and so people with vision problems are able to experience the website in a meaningful way. And then um, usability for everybody, right? Like, how does it work on a mobile device? Is it using language that you understand? Can you get to the tasks that you care about? So these are the four pillars that we're focusing on as an organization as we, as we figure out what equity and social justice means and what that means in terms of <coughs> delivering a good experience for our constituents. Um, yeah, minute, good? Yeah, that's it. So um, there you have it. Um, if you signed up, I will send out this deck. I recorded it. I will send out the deck and the recording. Um, Cameron has tech tips. I have peak democracy um, best practices, peak democracy action plan. This is similar to Derek's social media action plan. If you want to have a social media site, you have to do X, Y, and Z. Same thing with democracy. Yes. Can Cameron mention that maybe you have a supply list for five <clears throat> Yes, I will provide that one on one because we're not supposed to advocate for brands of things. So if you want it, I will send that on a one on one basis so okay. that I'm not putting a government imprimatur on buy this particular brand. Okay. Um, and again, so if we do the survey, um, if you'd like to participate in the survey, as we've learned today, we have a lot of experts here. Um, we've got a lot of tools. We have a lot of equipment that we can share. And um, everybody's really, I'm, I'm so impressed with everybody that I've met here so far. And I'd love to be able to call you to pick your brain about any number of things. All right, you're all free to go.